Hello anatomy colleagues, this is Dr. Alsip, and in this video we will be discussing all of the reproductive viscera, both internal and external, typically associated with an individual assigned male at birth. You will see this abbreviation AMAB, assigned male at birth, so those physical attributes in the form of viscera, which more traditionally has been referred to as biological or genetically male viscera that often, particularly in terms of external genitalia, would lead to an assignment of male at birth. Now, I want to note that the terminology that you will hear throughout this curriculum will vary, and concepts of sex and gender merit more than we will discuss uh, in these videos. Our anatomy team understand that neither sex or gender may be divisible by narrowly, and we hope to use terminology that is the most inclusive and appropriate. That is our goal. We are always learning and always appreciative um, of respectful and constructive feedback. Now, this session will be a bit on the longer side, so fair warning, um, as we have quite a bit to review regarding the gross anatomy of uh, individuals assigned male at birth or the viscera associated with that. So discussions of both external genitalia as well as internal pelvic viscera. So quite a bit to do, so let's get started. All right, we will start with structures associated with male uh, external genitalia starting with the scrotum, which is composed of multiple layers of tissues, including skin. Um, so that's why we have here this cutaneous skin extension, but as well as muscle and fascia. This extension will present as suspended from the perineum and inferior portions of the proximal penis. The scrotum is separated into two compartments by a septum, as you can see right here, and it's indicated externally here by this raffe, uh, which is a line or groove typically located in the midline of the scrotum. The scrotum contains the testes and distal portions of the spermatic cord. So you can see the testes here and portions of the spermatic cord right there. The different layers of the scrotum, as well as the spermatic cord deep to the skin, are homologous and contiguous of the layers of the anterior and anterior lateral abdominal wall. So as an example, the external spermatic fascia is homologous with the external oblique aponeurosis. And we'll talk a bit more about that when we get to the spermatic cord. As mentioned, the testes are located within the scrotum, and these are gonads that are responsible for the production of sperm and hormones, specifically testosterone. This location in the scrotum, and not as part of the internal pelvic viscera, plays a role in maintaining a temperature for the testes at around three to four degrees Celsius below body temperature. The location is not the only factor. We will talk of uh, another in a moment. So, uh, but just keep in mind that that's one of the, the reasons why there's a slightly lower temperature associated with the testes. One thing you will notice uh, in a gross anatomy dissection of the testes are that they are enclosed in a tough capsule. And two of the layers that make up this capsule include the tunica vaginalis, which is the outermost component, and the tunica albuginea, which is um, going to be a bit more intermediate and deep to the vaginalis. The tunica vaginalis is an interesting area. It's actually a continuation of the peritoneal process, processus vaginalis, which is formed before the descent of the testes from the abdomen to the scrotum. Now that proximal portion of the processus vaginalis actually occludes, but the, the more distal portions pers uh, persist as the tunica vaginalis. Failure of that more proximal portion to obliterate actually results in persistent communication from the scrot or with the scrotum and that peritoneal cavity, which can lead to a higher predisposition for indirect inguinal hernias. The tunica albuginea, so the, here, right here you can see the tunica vaginalis, which has been opened in order to look a little bit deeper. The tunica, oops, excuse me, the tunica albuginea is characteristically white um, or with a little bit of a bluish tinge in color. 
It is very dense and will project internally, as you can kind of see right here in this image. It will project internally to compartmentalize segments of the seminiferous tubules. So these seminiferous tubules are long and highly coiled, as you can very clearly see here uh, in this image. And it is here that spermatogenesis occurs. And from the tubules, the spermatozoa travel to the ret testes, to efferent ductules, to the head of the epididymis um, predominantly, but there is some connection kind of throughout. So here's your head of the epididymis. So around eight to 12 efferent ductules from the superior pole of the testis will drain into and actually form the head of the epididymis. The epididymis is going to lie posterior and slightly lateral to the testis, and it's composed of three major parts, the head, the body, and the tail of the epididymis, which is continuous with the ductus deferens, specifically the more proximal convoluted portion of the ductus deferens. The ductus or vas deferens conducts sperm from the epididymis to eventually open into the prostatic urethra. This is a tubular structure. It is uh, so thick that it's almost cord-like and it's going to travel within the spermatic cord with other contents to be discussed soon through the inguinal canal and the deep inguinal ring. At this point, it actually will um, diverge from other spermatic cord contents and it will course medially to reach kind of this base of the bladder towards the prostate region. So you can see it right here in this image in its more distal portion. And around this level of the prostate and uh, posterior bladder, the ductus deferens will dilate notably. And at this point, it's referred to as the ampulla of the ductus deferens. It is here that it joins <clears throat> with the duct of the seminal gland to form the ejaculatory duct, which we'll talk more about in a moment. But before we move away from the ductus deferens, I do want to mention one important clinical procedure regarding the ductus or vas deferens, and this is the vasectomy. That's vas, you can see here. A vasectomy is the ligation or embolization of the ductus deferens. So thinking of the function of the ductus deferens, which is the transport of sperm, if the vas is ligated, then transport will not be possible to the urethra, which is the pathway to the external environment. The spermatic cord begins at the deep inguinal ring, as we are hopefully getting familiar with at this point, will extend through the inguinal canal exit the superficial ring and will suspend the testes in the scrotum. Now, as mentioned previously, um, the spermatic cord uh, will have a major content of the ductus deferens. The other two major components are the testicular artery and the pampiniform plexus of veins. The testicular artery travels all the way from the abdominal aorta to the testis and is part of that pathway, um, as part of that pathway is within the spermatic cord. The pampiniform plexus of veins drain the testes and the epididymis and are highly anastomotic channels of veins. And the close relationship between these veins and the artery allows exchange of heat and helps facilitate that maintenance of the lower testicular temperature. Occasionally, for various reasons, these veins can become enlarged or dilated, and these are referred to as a varicocele. There are other contents of the spermatic cord that are smaller, so not quite as obvious in dissection. These, in, excuse me, these include the cremasteric artery, which will supply the cremaster muscle, which is surrounding the spermatic cord. The genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, so one of those branches of the lumbar plexus. As you might imagine, there's going to be autonomic fibers here as well, so these sympathetic fi fibers tend to follow the arteries, whereas the parasympathetics follow the ductus deferens to an extent. And uh, you'll also, as always, have lymphatics in the region as well. 
And as mentioned when discussing the scrotum, many of the layers that surround both the scrotum as well as the, um, or that's going to form the layers of the scrotum, as well as surrounding the spermatic cord, are going to be homologous and contiguous with the layers of the anterior and anterolateral abdominal wall. This list here shows the three major layers of tissues. So the external spermatic fascia, the cremaster muscle and fascia, and the internal spermatic fascia. And this equal sign, after the equal sign, will indicate the homologous structure in the anterior lateral abdominal wall. Of note here, there is a muscle that surrounds the spermatic cord, the cremaster muscle. It tends to be relatively thin, even in comparison to the fairly thin internal oblique muscle. All right, moving to internal pelvic viscera, we will start with the seminal glands, often referred to as the seminal vesicles in certain um, illustrations, like this one. This is a gland located near the prostate. Um, I'm going to outline it right here in this image. So it is near the prostate. It's going to be between the bladder and the rectum. The seminal gland produces a thick, more alkaline fluid with fructose that will uh, make up a significant portion of, of the semen. Its duct will join with the ampulla of the ductus deferens to form the ejaculatory ducts. So these ejaculatory ducts arise near that neck of the bladder. You can see right about here where it forms. And it will run through the posterior portion of the prostate parenchyma to reach the prostatic urethra. So you can see the prostatic urethra right here. And you can see where that ejaculatory duct is meeting up uh, and draining into that reason, region. It is here that the fluid from the seminal glands and the sperm that is transported via the ductus deferens will enter the urethra in a region called the seminal colliculus, which is a small protuberance in the prostatic urethra. So these contents will be joined by the secretions of the prostate gland. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the prostate. The prostate is closely associated with the neck of the bladder. So I'm gonna outline real quickly the prostate here. This is the bladder here. Um, it's often described as about the size of the walnut, and as I hope you begin to understand by now, the prostate surrounds the prostatic urethra, which you can see here. As also mentioned, the prostatic urethra will receive the contents of the ejaculatory ducts, and the prostatic ducts, which transport prostatic fluid, will open into the prostatic urethra as well, typically via multiple sinuses on either side of that seminal colliculus. One thing I do want to note here on this image is its close proximity to the anterior wall of the rectum. So this is the rectum here, the lumen of the rectum. There's the anterior wall. So if the prostate needs to be palpated, say to get an indication of disease or hypertrophy, it can be done so through the rectum. Around middle age, the prostate is prone to enlarge in size in certain regions, and this is actually uh, very common, and it's typically benign, but can certainly be caused by other re uh, reasons, which I'm sure you will touch on in more clinically-based lectures. But speaking of benign um, hyperplasia, this is referred to as benign prostatic hyperplasia. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to hypertrophy, but really hyperplasia is kind of the correct term here, um, or abbreviated as BPH. And this specifically occurs um, in glandular cells of the transitional or periurethral zone. Those cells will multiply, thus the hyperplasia, thus increasing the size of that region. And so if you think about increasing any size of the prostate, that could um, exert pressure or distort the, the shape of the prostatic urethra. And as you can imagine, with pressure or potential semi-occlusion of the urethra, this will affect the flow of urine and could even cause pain in that region. Another clinical procedure that we do want to mention is the transurethral resection of prostate, often shortened to TERP. And in this procedure, a resectoscope is inserted 
through the external urethral opening or meatus, sometimes you will hear it referred to as, and it will tra traverse through the spongy um, urethra in order to reach the prostatic urethra. And um, this will allow access to the prostate to allow portions to be removed. And this may occur in cases of severe BPH um, that's blocking sufficient urine flow or help alleviate other BPH symptoms. The last set of glands I want to discuss in this video are the bulbo urethral or CALPERS glands, if you're using the eponym. These are P-shaped glands located posterior lateral to the membranous portion of the urethra. So here is the bulbo urethral gland that I circled here. Right here is going to be that membranous urethra, kind of that portion between the prostatic urethra and the spongy urethra. The bulbo urethral glands produce a mucus-like secretion that will enter the spongy urethra through a fairly long duct uh, through the perineal membrane to reach the spongy urethra. So right here you can see the duct that is leading towards the spongy urethra here. The secretions of these glands will be initiated during sexual arousal. Okay, moving back to external genitalia, we will finish our discussions for this video with the penis, which is composed of two major parts. The two major parts are the root and the body of the penis. The root of the penis is located in the superficial perineal space. Um, so kind of in this image here, we're talking about this general region. Uh, I'm gonna focus more on this image down here for the discussion of the root because it does have attachment to some of the osteological structures associated with this region, specifically the crura of the root of the penis or the cruce if we're talking singular are closely associated with the ischiopubic ramus, or the um, sometimes it's shortened to ischial ramus. Ischiopubic is actually the, the more correct term. The crura are composed of corpora cavernosa, which are paired erectile tissues. More to come on the erectile tissues in a moment. The bulb of the penis, which is also part of the root, is going to be composed of erectile tissue as well. And um, specifically, it's going to be composed of corpus spongiosum. And that urethra, as you can see, if we go back to this image, the urethra will enter the bulb of the penis um, via its posterior surface. So at that point, the urethra transitions to the spongy or penile urethra. The body of the penis is composed of the same erectile tissues as what forms the crura and the bulb. These are the, the paired uh, corpus or corpora cavernosa, which are making up the bulk of this region. The corpora cavernosa are enclosed within a dense fibroelastic sheath of connective tissue called the tunica albigenia. And blood flow into the sinuses, as you can see in this image here, uh, blood flow into the sinuses of these erectile tissues lead to penile engorgement and compression of venous outflow channels, which results in penile erection. The corpus spongiosum, I'm gonna circle where that's located, is located in the body of the penis as well on the ventral portion of the penis. Understand, that in anatomical position, the penis is in an erect state. Thus, the reason that this is the ventral, so ventral or anterior surface of the penis. The corpus spongiosum contains less erectile tissue than the corpora cavernosa and is enclosed in a thinner tunica albigenia. The urethra will travel or traverse the entire length of the, uh, the, the uh, corpus spongiosum, and it will end it at the external urethral opening or meatus. At the distal end, the corpus spongiosum will actually enlarge and assume a more bulbous shape on this distal end to form the glans penis. 
More to come regarding the erectile tissues in the next session, but introducing the basic anatomical structure here. All right, we have reached our summary slide. I did warn you this would be a little bit of a longer video, but much foundational information to cover here. Please take your time to review the basics regarding the viscera discussed here, particularly location of the structures, as well as the basic composition. As always, please feel free to reach out with any questions, and thank you for your time and attention.